What are so many people getting wrong about our nutrition and about the way our metabolism and our bodies work? Join me for today's episode with quantum biologist, Dr. Sarah Pugh to talk about this and so much more. Welcome back. My name is Sarah. This is the Sarah Kleiner Wellness YouTube channel. Thank you so much for being here and watching today's episode with Dr. Sarah Pugh, who is a quantum biologist. We are going to talk about her story. We're going to talk about what so many people don't understand about the energy management system of the body and how this is causing people to spend a whole bunch of time and effort looking at meal plans and calories and exercise trackers and all of those things and how there's a much more simple way to look at things that actually works. We're going to talk about hormones and how people are hyper-focused on these more downstream hormones like progesterone and testosterone and how we can actually influence those hormones to change when we look at hormones from a master hormone point of view. So, so much really wonderful information in this episode. And I'm going to encourage you as well to follow Dr. Sarah Pugh. Her YouTube channel is amazing. She puts out wonderful content. So that is going to be linked down in the show notes for you as well. We're going to talk a lot about leptin and nutrition. If you are interested in taking my leptin course, I'm actually going to be increasing the price on that starting February the 15th of 2023. So if you want to jump in on that before I take the price up and get a discount, you can use code podcast to save on that. And that link is going to be down there in the show notes for you. I'm also coming out with a quantum nutrition course that's going to encompass a lot of the things that Sarah and I talk about in this episode as well. That's going to be coming out on the 15th and you can save 25% if you're on that initial wait list. So that wait list link will be down in the show notes for you as well, along with a ton of timestamps that can help you navigate through this episode through the different topics. And if there's one little point that sticks out to you, you can jump back and listen to it again. So check all of that out down in the show notes. Two quick shout outs to a couple sponsors. Viva Rays is my source for circadian rhythm glasses. You can use my code Yogi to save on those. They also will do prescriptions for you as well. We talk a ton about circadian rhythms and the importance of those in this episode. So make sure to check out Viva Rays if you're looking for a really high quality source of circadian glasses or blue blocking glasses. And Optimal Carnivore is my source for filling in nutritional gaps. You can use my code carnivore uppercase Y to save on those supplements. Again, those are gonna be linked down in the show notes for you. So thank you to those two sponsors and let's go ahead and jump into this episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Today, I have Dr. Sarah Pugh, and we're going to talk about all things quantum biology, quantum physics, circadian biology, just wherever the conversation goes. So, Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, no, thank you for all the information and everything that you shared um, and share with us. So, I'm here to sort of provide extra and remind people of certain things which we forget easily about our hormones and also being a biochemist and also a biophysicist to give you some stuff that actually works as well because like Sarah I've been on a quite a long health journey and there are certain things which work and certain things that we find out that don't so as soon as we find something that does work we can't wait to share. Exactly and I feel like that's kind of where we both got to with the quantum biology and, and circadian biology is like kind of been on these roads of searching and and trying on different things trying out different things and then you find this and you're like oh where has this been my whole life you know <laughs> yeah um, well I'd love if you would tell my listeners a little bit about your history yourself um, education and all that stuff before we dive into maybe some specific topics Okay, so just to be quick, I am a scientist originally, and I um, did genetics and biochemistry, then I did a postdoc, and it was on statins and cholesterol and, and lipids. I've also worked on dopamine receptors. Um, my voice doesn't normally sound like this. It's just, um, <laughs> you know, I could take on a whole different career with this voice. Um, 
<laughs> but then I left um, science because I felt pressurized into publishing data saying statins were good when they're not. And that might even come up in this discussion because cholesterol is really important for an anti-aging hormone called pregnenolone. Um, and then I left to become a Pilates teacher of all things because I also had terrible backache. So that's where I share a common background with Sarah that I am a movement teacher as well. Then that led into myofascial release and then it led, in, it led into hypnosis because my clients would all of a sudden tell me really private things in the middle of a one to one. Then hypnosis led to stage hypnosis and um, because, you know, I like to, to everything I do, everything has to be done to excess. But I've been doing hypnosis for about 10 years now, and I've sort of developed my own what I call quantum hypnosis because you just find stuff that, that really works. So I am very left brained, but also I'm extremely right brained as well. And I think another thing that Sarah and I have in common is um, we've both done carnivore and keto, but then sort of outgrown it. Then um, Sarah's weight loss and weight gain, I know she's lost and gained 100 pounds, I think, two or three times. I have never done anything as drastic as that. It's been more the same 20 pounds about five times but I think a lot of women really resonate with this sort of problem of are we doomed or are we doing something wrong is it something in our environment is it emotional is there any medication for it and you know what can we do about um, these hormones and how can we not trash our mental health um, with weight loss and gain because it can be quite sort of worrying because I work with clients and some women are so sort of obsessed with weight loss they'll sacrifice absolutely everything for it and that was something that when I found out about Sarah and her 100 pound weight loss and gain I was really fascinated because I didn't realize it she'd had that background as well so I think probably in this podcast we'll be sort of talking about um, not hardcore science because that might be a bit technical but sort of man and women related things to hormones food quantum biology sleep misconceptions uh, how to save money um, which supplements are good and which are bad because being a biochemist I've been into supplements for maybe 20 years and I have tried absolutely everything I think so I'm happy to discuss that with Sarah or my clients but I've now had a paradigm shift and it's a bit like the the ex-smokers I'm quite anti quite a lot of supplements now but I'd never stop somebody else's exploration or journey so I'm just going to go and see where this conversation um, goes with, with Sarah and what value I can offer uh, you and obviously Sarah's going to answer all your questions in the comments. So um, anything that pokes your interest, drop drop a comment. Yeah, thank you. That's amazing. And you know, one thing you didn't mention uh, in all of that diverse background, you know, the mm -hmm. PhD and and all that education, and then doing Pilates and and hypnosis. Um, you also trained in medical ketogenic diets, right? Is that oh correct? yes, yes, I did, and also I trained in functional <laughs> neurology and did that for five years. I think sometimes with life, you know, it goes. Yeah. I sometimes forget all of my knowledge unless somebody asks me a question. But yes, I did, and I'm still very keen on medical ketogenic diets. But I think it's something that we'll probably end up talking about this is that I, you know, so many people think that if you micromanage your diet to the perfection, you're going to solve all your problems. But I've found that there's like a hierarchy or a pyramid and food wasn't as important as I thought it was. So yes, thank you for reminding me about my own CV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just love for the audience to know about the, di the diversity of your education and, and how much you've done. And so when you speak on specific topics, I think it kind of qualifies you even more to them. Uh, you know, my, my audience just appreciates that. So I, I appreciate you kind of providing me with all this background before we even jumped on the call. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and, and you're also certified in, uh, in the quantum biology certification. That's the one I'm also certified in. Um, so you've got that background as well as that certification, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Because I think, as I was saying, um, like, how did I meet you? I used to find mm -hmm. your reels when you never spoke really funny. And I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> this lady's totally bonkers. But I still liked and followed. And then, like I was saying to you, I one day watched your YouTube and thought, oh, my gosh, this person is so intelligent and articulate. And, um, you know, I must get to know her more. And then I when you switched to quantum, I thought, well, Sarah obviously has discovered a new channel and um, I'll go down and see wh where it takes me. And a lot of it I knew 
knew or I knew already. I just hadn't joined the dots. And I think, again, you probably found the same because, you know, you've got quite a diverse background. Because I I know that, like me, you're really happy to say, OK, I've discovered something new. I'm just willing to move on and say I was maybe not wrong, but this is better. And I'm the right. same. I know you've used to be carnivore yogi and then you've now moved into Sarah Kleiner wellness and I've never asked you about do you eat about you know how did you get into yoga and do you still teach that you know um how did your um career sort of progress yeah I mean that was all because of basically leaving my career in sales to be home with my daughter Mm. um and just needing some kind of a stress outlet because it was very demanding to to uh, parent a special needs child and just not ever have any breaks or anything like that. And so the yoga helped me. Um, that's why I got into it and started teaching because I wanted to help other people and it was helping me so much just to deal with stress and the mental health side of, of just being a parent to a special needs child. Um, and I've taught for 13 years publicly and now I've kind of retired that a little bit, uh, mostly because of what has happened since 2020. And unfortunately the yoga community here, uh, they want you to do specific things in order to teach in the studio that I'm not willing to do. And people can kind of read between the lines on that one. Uh, but unfortunately it's kind of alienated me a bit from the yoga community. So all my yoga that I do now is really just self, um, you know, yoga with myself and, and meditation with myself. And maybe one day I'll get back out there and teach a little bit. I, I don't think I've lost too much of the knowledge of the, over the last 13 years, but you know, um, there's something about medical autonomy that I appreciate and, uh, that hasn't been respected in the yoga community here, unfortunately. So that's another reason kind of for switching over my platform is like, I'm not even teaching yoga anymore. And I'm not really doing carnivore anymore. I still think it's a great healing modality and, and great to be used therapeutically, but I just wanted to expand uh, the, the brand, you know, or, or just my message, I guess, to be more inclusive. And it's interesting. I don't know how many people you get because your, your uh, brand is busy superhuman, right? <laughs> oh, yes. It was to do with, I, um, you know, when you, I've never actually fully settled on exactly what I'm going to be. Mm. Um, whereas now I have, um, you know, I found the quantum yet. I, you know, I just taught Pilates as Sarah and then I just did hypnotist as I had a Carla mystery was my stage name. And then I just did therapy as Sarah, but it was more just me as a person, but then mm. busy superhuman. I think it's sort of partly what we're going to talk about is that um, sometimes you've got to go slower in order to actually yes. be go faster in the end and what you said about becoming a yoga teacher is partly why I became a Pilates teacher because when I was reading up on good jobs for certain mental health Pilates teaching and yoga is very good for people who've got bipolar polar and stuff like that and I at that time of my life just needed a career that was very holistic and mm -hmm. for everybody or anyone that's listening I can't emphasize the value of just very simple things like yoga Pilates Tai Chi mm -hmm. um, and everybody and anyone can do them and then obviously with the quantum side about the exclusion zone water and things like that is massively important but then being from the neurological side it gives our brains and neurology a very big movement vocabulary and the bigger our movement vocabulary is the less likely we are to get injuries and pain so you know even if something doesn't look complicated and it's not crossfit and it doesn't burn lots of calories i yes. think it, it has a huge value in overall health yeah, I, I love that um, kind of slowing down in order to accomplish more because I don't know about you, you and I kind of work with people who want to, they want to lose weight. A lot of women are just complete, and men too, they're obsessed with the weight loss and they want you to give them a meal plan, a calorie amount um, and an exercise program and then to call it a day. And I just feel like that's doing a disservice to people to, to do those things. And they, and I don't see them working, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I actually have more people stop doing the CrossFit, stop doing the calorie counting and the calorie restriction and get back to quantum health, circadian biology, and actually say, you have poor mitochondrial function. And that's why you're having to count your calories. That's why you're gaining weight. That's why you have leptin resistance. And we need to go back 
to the root cause and fix those things. And a lot of things like your appetite, if you're eating the right ancestral foods, your appetite, your exercise energy output is going to be a bit more self-correcting at the end of the day. What, what do you say about that? Oh, no, I completely agree. Because I suppose um, when it comes to hormones, um, anybody that tries to buy into the calories in, calories out, obviously doesn't yes. understand thermodynamics or hormones because obviously we've got cortisol, which... Um, is so important that um, if we don't make it, we die. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's something that when we're stressed or inflamed, our body makes more of, of it. And it has the byproduct of working in the opposing insulin. So if cortisol goes up, you're going to disturb your insulin. And then insulin is another hormone that's involved in body fat storage. And you can get cortisol resistance as well as mm -hmm. insulin resistance. But in some ways, I've actually jumped the gun there because I think something we were talking about in the background was, was there's a big hierarchy of hormones. And the sex hormones are down at the bottom here. Then we've mm -hmm. got insulin in the middle, then cortisol and melatonin a bit higher. Then we've got leptin and oxytocin up here. For, for people who don't know, oxytocin is the cuddle hormone and the orgasm hormone and the trust hormone. Well, we're not going to talk about that today because we could be here forever. But what it means is that um, you need to fix the kind of highest hormone in the, um, in the hierarchy or say for people that like the film Lost Boys, you need to kill the chief vampire hormone problem to get rid of the others. Uh, and a lot of people are scrabbling away, fighting with insulin or fighting with testosterone or progesterone mm -hmm. or estrogen problems. Uh, and again, estrogen and testosterone are involved in body weight and they haven't gone higher up the hierarchy. But then back to what you were saying about calories is in terms of quantum biology, it's we call it the electron transport chain. And people don't, who are technical will understand what we mean and people who aren't it's not called the calorie or the fat transport chain. So our bodies obviously use something else for energy. Um, and it's not all about fats and carbs and macros and, um, and calories. And uh, again, there are numerous studies over decades where women restrict calories and exercise more. And I think in the biggest study of all, they lost a grand total of half a pound compared to the control. So enormous meta studies have still disproved the calories in, calories out, yet, yet people still keep doing it. And mm -hmm. I think this is where the paradigm shift of the leptin reset is really important. And it does come back to slowing down in order to go faster. And back to how do I know you? It was... Um, I explored your leptin reset and I found it uh, really, really helpful. I already knew about Jack Cruz and his work and I love Jack Cruz. I think he's really intelligent and brilliant, but he's a man and he's got certain preferences. Like I'm, I live in the Northern hemisphere and he's really anti. He would tell me, oh, you've got to move to another country. You can't get better. Whereas, you know, I've had massive results in this cold climate doing your leptin In the reset. UK, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he's a man and we're women. And I found, and I think you also did, that some of his protocol is there's too much protein for women. Mm -hmm. And you've obviously modified it in your way. I've modified mine for, for me. So... Yeah. Shall we just sort of talk about it? Because I think it's something that people think, oh, well, I'll do this leptin reset and in 21 days I'll be a size eight. But right. it, took, it took me about um, a month to, for anything to happen. And then I was yep. at the time experimenting with a leptin supplement, which, you know, we're not going to talk about in this podcast, but um, it, it doesn't happen straight away. And that's mm -hmm. the thing that, uh, that people can get frustrated about is. And would you, what would you say happened when you did it? Yeah, I mean, that that's the thing we have to, like you said, originally just slow down to get those results and people are so driven to get, like you said, be a size eight after 30 days. And that's mm -hmm. not really how this type of a program works, because you kind of explain this hierarchy of hormones. And I think people are obsessed with micro focusing on estrogen or progesterone or testosterone or these. If your cortisol is messed up, and if your leptin is messed up, guess what's also going to be messed up is those mm -hmm. hormones, right? So what the program does is it works on leptin and it also works on cortisol. And we go back to resetting those natural rhythms. So getting your cortisol melatonin patterns set properly and getting your leptin set properly. Cause leptin is supposed to, leptin is basically like the stored energy on your body, being able to communicate with your brain. 
And for most people, because their cortisol melatonin patterns are so screwed up, that's not even happening. And so they can go on these calorie deficit programs. They can go exercise really hard and they might have results for a little bit, but at the end of the day, their body is telling them they're starving to death. And the signal of the stored energy to the brain is not occurring. So if we're not going back and working with resetting cortisol melatonin patterns, reestablishing that connection with leptin and the hypothalamus, then any diet, any meal plan, any exercise plan that you do is going to be exhausting. Mm -hmm. And it's probably going to further dysregulate that cortisol pattern because then, you know, you're restricting your calories so much that you're waking up in the middle of the night. You're not getting adequate sleep. You're not getting those repair processes happening. Um, and so I think the, the community, even the, the diet communities need to back up a step um, and, and work with these fundamental things like our circadian rhythms. Um, the, the da I know you as a scientist have just gone deep down this rabbit hole, but the information available on circadian rhythms and every aspect of our health is available. It has been studied. Everything from uh, hormone, hormone imbalances, uh, hormone cancers, cancer in general, um, Alzheimer's, all, all of these issues that people are dealing with at skyrocketing rates now are, it's going back to, um, a lot of it is circadian health, um, and mitochondrial health, you know? Oh, absolutely. Cause I think what people don't realize is that <clears throat> light is the biggest driver of metabolism and yes. light in itself is a nutrient. And also we only get about a third of our e electrons. I don't even want to say calories anymore from, yeah. from, from food. food. Mm -hmm. And when you sit down and think about it logically, I mean, I've done a seven day fast and I want to do a 40 day one, one day. I mean, and I could do that, but imagine trying to not sleep for seven. I can't, if I, if I don't have any sleep for 24 hours and it's bright light for, I'd be a complete lunatic. And I think that oh, yeah. alone shows, oh, hang on a minute maybe light does drive everything about me. And, and also temperature, I think, is some way higher up and trumps um, mm -hmm. food as well. And I think that's massively overlooked as well, especially in the winter here, people using too much central heating and being mm -hmm. averse to cold therapy. And I think it's, again, like you were saying, there's too much emphasis on food making us fat, where there's a lot of other factors. And like you said, there's lots of studies on blue light and diabetes and um, blue light and obesity and um, sleep deprivation. And again, I often get people who um, are shift workers that say, well, that's, you know, am I doomed? And I always say, no, you just have yeah. to be more vigilant about grounding. You've got to change your light bulbs in your house. And sometimes mm -hmm. I like to bring props to people. And Oh, yeah. Yeah you'd use something like this, which is like an Edison light bulb. It's not an LED and just something so simple, which took me 10 minutes to do in my house can make a massive difference to somebody. And, and it's so overlooked that you know, it cost me probably $15 to buy a pack of those light bulbs, that there are other things out there that contribute to our weight. And it's not just us making excuses um, because of course there'll be the 25 year old bro scientist saying that we are, um, right. But like there's again, there'll be hundreds of thousands of women who complete or more that completely agree with us that it's like, well, what am I doing wrong? But I think back to what we were talking about of people being in a rush. The other mm -hmm. thing which I've done and I'm it'd be hypocritical not to talk about it is use supplements and medication. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't work in the long run because, I mean, there are things like Saxenda, um, which um works on the glp1 system and it mm -hmm. but it's not hitting leptin that's more the glucose and, and it's an anti-diabetic drug then you've got obviously stimulants and things like fentamine that work on your neurotransmitters and your appetite center but it's not fixing it does it's not um sorting out the fundamental reason uh, and as soon as you start to push your body one way it's going to rebound and fight back then of course people who are on the internet a lot and quite keen on products they might have heard all about peptides and growth hormone and things like that and, and again yes growth hormone does play a role in body composition you know obviously the liver king we may have all heard about i've got nothing against that whatsoever but you're still putting in um, a compound from a lab that you don't know what it's been made from whether it's contaminated or not and as we'll probably come to in our in this 
our bodies know the difference between what we manufactured ourselves, say thyroxine or um, growth hormone versus something that we put in. Because during my PhD, I spent a lot of time shining light at tryptophans and tyrosines. So I know that there's ways to impart information onto biological molecules. And, you know, obviously I'm not going to go any, into the science in, in any more depth because we can, can we can bring the context to the listeners so they can start to see, well, uh, oh, hang on a minute, you know, you're saying that I can put these hormones in and um, my body can tell the difference, even though the structure is identical. And does this actually matter? And it's like, yes, it matters massively mm -hmm. because we make hormones at special times of the day. Yes. And we'll give maybe thyroid as an example that there's T4 thyroxine, which is not active. Uh, I call it the coffee bean. Then it gets ground up into T3 or a co ground coffee and it becomes active. And then, um, during the day, the body pulses out little bits of T3, whereas people that take medication, they take a great big giant tablet in the morning and it's completely unnatural to how the body would naturally produce thyroid. And we've got so many negative feedback loop situations in our body that if we put too much T3 in, our body will think, hang on a minute, um, I don't like this. I'm going to turn it into reverse T3. And this is a bit like me locking my coffee in the cupboard when I'm trying to give up caffeine. So no matter what we do, with putting exogenous hormones in with the exception of HRT uh, that's different your body's always going to find a way to um do something about it and then all of a sudden the weight loss drugs or the peptides or the cardarine or whatever you're taking stops working because you didn't address the the root cause and I always say to people you can't outsmart mother nature I, I've tried for 25 years <laughs> can't but again like I said right at the beginning of the podcast I don't have any issues with doing this with people because people sometimes have to go through a journey you've got to let them do it let them not mess it up per se or let them saturate an avenue and then support them what went to say well okay I'm stuck and not be well oh I told you so because humans are naturally really really curious and I think from speaking to you or listening to you you've had some experience with thyroid medication that didn't work and then mm -hmm. Again, we'll talk about probably some other medication later that can make people gain weight and they don't realize that that medication's doing it. So, um, and I'm sure your listeners have had nasty experiences with thyroid diagnoses. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah. um, Carrie. Thank you so much for watching today's episode with Dr. Sarah Pugh. Quick reminder to follow her and her content. All of her links are going to be down in the show notes. She puts out these really fantastic short educational videos all the time on her YouTube channel. And I'm a huge, huge fan of her work. I think that we need to keep on spreading this information to more people, especially those who are really spinning their wheels out on their health and trying to dial things in. And again, hyper-focusing on perhaps the wrong things when we could be swimming far upstream and focusing on these larger things that are going to influence all these downstream hormones and effects on our metabolism. So check out her channel. Quick little reminder, my leptin reset course, the price will be increasing on February 15th. I've added a ton of new material and have a few more things I'm going to throw in there. And I'm increasing the price on February 15th, 2023. If you want to take advantage and get that price now, you can also get a discount by using the code podcast. That link is in the show notes. And my quantum nutrition course, which is going to encompass how we look at food through this lens of quantum nutrition, that's coming out on February 15th. And you can save 25% if you are on that initial wait list, which is down in the show notes as well. So jump on that wait list. One more thank you to one more sponsor. Upgraded Formulas is my source for hair tissue mineral analysis to understand my minerals, mineral balance within the body. Mineral test is going to be a little bit more difficult to understand if you just do it as a blood test. It's not going to be as accurate as a hair test that's going to show 60 to 90 days of what's going on. You can use my code YOGI12 or YOGI if you've already used that code before to save at Upgraded Formulas. Link is going to be down in the show notes for you. And thanks to all the sponsors of today's show. Let's go ahead and jump back into this conversation with Dr. Sarah Pugh. Hope you're enjoying yeah, uh, it. Carrie is, I would call my mentor, and you and Carrie have got a thyroid um, hormone course coming up. So I think it's quite timely that sort of I've got my explanation and I've got no idea what's in your course. I just um, 
work with Carrie and and you and love firing questions at you. So you might want to say your thyroid story. Yeah, I mean, basically, <clears throat> after doing carnivore for a couple of years, I decided to do a full thyroid panel because I, I was thinking about getting pregnant and I wanted to just make sure my thyroid was optimized. And that was the first time that I found out that my T3 was actually low. Mm. Um, and a lot of the people in the carnivore community and the keto community say that's not a problem, that it's like insulin, you're more insulin sensitive. Um, so your insulin's going to be lower after you've been low carb or keto or for a long time. Um, I happen to disagree <laughs> because I was also struggling at that time with extra weight that wouldn't budge no matter how much fasting I did, no matter how much I restricted, no matter how much I carnivored harder, you know, I, I was trying to do everything that a lot of these carnivore influencers were telling me. And at the same time, they're telling me your T3 is, is low and that's normal for someone doing keto or carnivore. And that's not a problem. It just means your, your thyroid hormone is more sensitive um, and you don't need as much T3. Um, but at the same time, number one, I had the weight loss resistance. And number two, I was having issues uh, keeping a pregnancy. So I tried taking T3 and it was a disaster. I mean, mm. like the worst insomnia, My I couldn't take a full breath. I had severe air hunger severe heart palpitations. And I just, I told my doctor, I was like, I think it's the thyroid. She's like, yeah, it's the T3. You just, she's like, you just don't need it. Um, so I couldn't take thyroid medication because it was just making me anxious and I couldn't sleep and I felt terrible. Um, and I couldn't, I mean, and, then, and my T3 was still low and I was still having all the issues, the infertility and the extra weight, the slowed metabolism that comes along with T3. So what I had to do was number one, optimize my circadian rhythm and really, really prioritize the first two hours of morning sunlight, mm -hmm. uh, because that's actually where thyroid hormone, uh, the, the synthesizing begins is with that first two hours of, of morning light, sunrise and UVA in particular. Um, so that was number one. And then blocking the artificial light at night was huge, huge, huge. Again, we have so much scientific literature that's that shows if you are exposing your body to artificial light at night you're at risk for all kinds of uh, thyroid issues thyroid cancers so that was also key and then i also began to implement some seasonal carbohydrates uh one to two days a week and when people think carb cycling they think oh she's eating pecan pie and you know <laughs> cookies and ice cream no, if it was summertime, I would say what's seasonal right now. And I would eat some of those carbs at the end of my meal. Um, you know, and that would be how I would bring myself out of ketosis a couple of days a week. And for me, between the morning sunlight, blocking artificial light at night, and then throwing in some seasonal foods, uh, the, the thyroid issue corrected. Um, also red light therapy was tremendous. Grounding was tremendous. Being outdoors, all of those things, I think, in the cellular hydration piece as well came together to fix that issue because the medication didn't help. It wasn't doing anything. And I didn't discard carnivore or keto, but I just started taking a couple of days out a week. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think people are so, uh, dogmatic about these diets and they let them become their entire identity, which is another reason I changed my name away from carnivore yogi, because I was like, my, I'm not just a diet. This is not who I am. <laughs> you know, I'm more than this. Um, I think people get into that trap and get into the Facebook groups and get into the dogma and they can't hear any of this information because it goes against what the, the keto carnivore gurus are saying yet they have extra weight yet they have infertility yet they have all these issues. And it's like, when are we going to wake up and actually have some common sense people? <laughs> so. Oh yeah, definitely. Because what you mentioned there, there's lots of really interesting points that I noticed because um, back to the blue light and the thyroid, I should, I often yeah. wear a scarf in front of my mm -hmm. computer. I just have, I just forgot today. And also um, I obviously have my blue blockers as well. 
Um, so what you mentioned about the UVA in the morning, that's back to what I was saying about that's the trigger for our body to make our own thyroid. And it knows the difference between thyroxin and the from a box and thyroxin from the sun. In the UK and sometimes other countries, people can't, can't get T3 on prescription anyway. So they already have a, another layer of thyroid problem. Th then what you were saying about the... Um, uh, eating carbs uh, seasonally so sometimes people uh, bottle up their desire for carbs and then eat loads of cookies and stuff and mm -hmm. it becomes a binge eating problem when really what what it is is sometimes our bodies know better that there is I can't remember the exact paper but I think our thyroid does need a small amount of fructose uh, now and again to function but we can make fructose ourselves like gluconeogenesis mm -hmm. but uh, that's sort of not not quite enough um, so I think it's all back to just um, listening to what your your body's telling you. And the thing about the seasonal carbs and, and the fruit, that's back. There's this, there's many layers to this because this is back to this ties in really quantum, actually, because first of all, back to Pilates and yoga, that's a way of our brains knowing where our joints are in space. And if they don't if our brain doesn't know that it gets really stressed, then neurology, which I did for a long time, and I still do. That's when if your eyes in a Ears and your senses are giving mixed signals it's like a gps that's broken and your brain can get very anxious about that anybody that's had vertigo will know the anxiety is horrific or got the wrong glasses prescription but then on another level if we don't know where we are on the planet the geolocation that's again can be a massive stressor for the brain so eating local and seasonal it, it, it's not just about protecting the environment there's actually a genuine neurological and biological reason for um, having having something local and seasonal because it helps our brain re-establish okay right I'm in you're in Georgia aren't you mm -hmm. and I'm in the UK it just constantly reminds me where I am because our brains are basically this complicated wonderful thing locked in a box uh, and, it, and it needs to know where we are and again the mitochondria are inside and if I go and eat a pineapple tomorrow the mitochondria will go berserk because the only thing that's growing here at the moment is maybe some certain breeds of potatoes are they going to get a big surprise and inflammation and chaos are just exactly the same word um and we all know inflammation is bad so it's not some silly fad uh, about eating seasonal and local or me trying to be an eco warrior there's an extremely uh, relevant biological reason and, and and this comes down to the people like me and you who do everything that we should but we still have a problem like I know people mm -hmm. just go carnivore and the whole life is perfect or yes like I was going to talk about my quantum parents my, my dad spent when we went to Vietnam and New Zealand because my mum annoys him he sat outside every single day so he watched the sun rise and the sunset he's he's wow. nearly 80 he didn't have any problems no he really enjoyed the holiday he went on a moped he um, didn't get really any jet lag and that's an example of he made one change uh, and that changed his whole holiday so, uh, yet there are people like me or you or other people who might be listening who, who who are doing everything right and thinking oh well well, well what else is there you know what am I doing wrong and mm -hmm. I especially find it in the keto or food community people mm -hmm. can't accept that food is information and food's light yes and again back to what I was saying at the beginning light is the biggest driver of metabolism and you're not betraying the, the, the keto god or the carnivore queen if you eat eat mm -hmm. some fruit. And obviously there are certain people out there that advocate eating lots of fruit every day and vast yeah, amounts yeah. of carbs. That's not what we're talking about. We're no, talking about no. maybe an apple once a week off my tree or um, maybe like you were saying, some carbs at the end of the meal. When I started to add carbs, I didn't do it in the morning meal. I always- No, I never do it in the morning protein and fat and then I've got apple trees and stuff in my garden so I was just des I was drawn to them and Carrie actually says that it can be quite a stressor on a human being to be around fruit and not being allowed to eat it it's a very primal thing that you know all, all we're designed to do is survive like we're designed mm -hmm. for survival not performance yes we can hack ourselves to perform but ultimately we want to survive and it drives our biochemistry berserk well mine anyway to sit in my garden with all these apples and I'm not allowed to eat them so, <laughs> so that's I think 
um, where I changed a bit because my hair started to fall out and people oh, kept wow. saying, oh, it's a vitamin D deficiency. And I'm like, no, it isn't because I've measured it. Mm-hmm. I've, I go outside. I've been away to a place that's got a UVI of 12. I've got one sperity lamp. I'm probably going to buy another. That's another topic. It's not that. Um, can't you just accept that maybe um, I, I should vary my diet a bit? And you can't just right. say oh, you need to do your keto more keto or your carnivore more carnivore you know there are some people and I don't disagree with it at all that do really well on just beef but I just think that's isolating people from other humans because you know we under if I came to your house or you to mine and you wanted to just eat beef I totally understand but I don't think 98% of the rest of the population would no they don't they don't and you know for for many reasons I think some people can just be okay on Mm -hmm. on that sort of food um and I don't I'm not sitting here saying that they are lying or, you know, because I've talked with people and they're like, oh, those people are all lying and they're all full of crap. I'm like, I'm not trying to rock their apple Mm -hmm. cart. I, I, you know, let them do what they're doing and they're happy and they're enjoying it. I'm here and I'm having this conversation for the people that are trying to do the all beef and they're trying to do the all keto 365 days a year. And they are having the hair fall out and they are having trouble sleeping and they're not losing weight and they don't feel good. And they're being just told over and over again, you're not, you're just not doing it hard enough. You're not doing it long enough. You're not doing, giving it a chance. You're not doing it right. Um, I'm here to challenge that those, <laughs> those mm. notions, you know, That's exactly what, like back to the beginning of our conversation about you've got to slow down in order to go faster. And the the reason I um, got on this mantra is because um, I went away for five weeks and I'm a massive workaholic and I couldn't do any work for five weeks and it drove me mad in the beginning. And then I had a massive revelation of how selfish I'd been and um, what, you know, all the things I'd done wrong about work. And then just let it go and didn't answer any emails and just thought, oh, well, if my business blows up, I'll just start another one. And then I all (laughs) of a sudden found it so easy to enter a flow state, which for people who've not heard of those, it's when you naturally go into a sort of situation, basically you get high on your own supply, your own dopamine, serotonin, uh, anandamide. It's a special blend and it can be through prayer, extreme sport, uh, art, Pilates, sex, or all sorts of things. It's each person will find their own flow state. And that's how I was able to access my own creativity and all of a sudden think of, oh, this is how I want my business to go forwards in the future. Uh, And um, that's where I was able to, like you were saying, you rebranded and, you know, I never completely fully became any brand. I was always not sure because I was doubting myself and it was all um, came from having to slow down and then I was able to enter a creative state but this is also really important for you as well and other busy people that when you go into a flow state you're massively more productive and like you've always massively impressed me of just how much you get done and I never knew you came from a sales background but that explains a lot now (laughs) um and and I think it's always a back to just taking nootropics or smart drugs or that, that's not the answer. Yes, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously I've done that and yes, or or even psychedelics, I'm totally fine with that. They've got their place in health, but we are equipped with our own sort of natural ways to be able to do amazing things. And that's why quantum massively attracts me because it's a whole world of ways to, hit so many different systems in the body gently rather than one like thing very hard. And I just think, yep. okay, if you can do a bit for the light, a bit for the neurology, a bit for the food, a bit for the grounding, a bit for the sleeping, a bit for the hormones, collectively, it can all have a massive effect. And not every single person can afford sperity lamps or red mm-hmm. light panels, but everybody can go out and see the sunset. And I think That's why I love quantum so much, because absolutely anybody can do it and you can Mm -hmm. make it as cheap or as expensive as you want. And sometimes buying all the gear and having no idea doesn't work either because you've got to actually put the time in to like get up and see the sunset or you've got to um, 
you know, maybe um, change your afternoon or evening routine to not watch TV or not go to the cinema as much or make sure you see the sunset because the sunset at the moment is an annoying time of half past four or five. And quite a lot of people have said, oh, I'm always doing something then. Mm -hmm. So I think it's sort of back to, again, um, <clears throat> yes, there are all these uh, gadgets and drugs and things out there that can help you. And they're all very interesting and all very fascinating and all do work, but they're not sustainable. Right. Whereas once you've reset your leptin, I always and I was going to ask you about this anyway. I was starting to talk about leptin maintenance because, you know, say if I suddenly reset my reset my leptin now and all of a sudden I went back to doing five CrossFits per week back to sort of. um not eating till 1 um, p.m. and then eating before bedtime, mm -hmm. I would just go back to being leptin resistant again, wouldn't I? Um, and I don't know how quick, but once people have done the leptin reset, and obviously this, again, it's your course, um, and I have my own personal way of, okay, well, how do I maintain this? You've obviously got your um way and it might even be your next course you know leptin version two because obviously i'm a massive fan of the first leptin reset and i just think people should jump on that i'm not trying to like mm -hmm. sell it for you i'm just saying it's kind of um, <laughs> well, i've told you. you to put the price up loads of times and i think i it's know i'm going to <laughs> <laughs> i just think it's something that's so simple yeah. And you can take it to whatever level you want. But I find the hardest bit is the not eating in after sunset bit. Yeah. And um, maybe you want to elaborate on this because I've obviously brought up lots of topics, asked you more than one question at once. <laughs> and then I think it's sort of time for you to sort of say, well, OK, we know how to reset leptin. Um, how do we maintain it? Yeah, I think that's important. And what the program really emphasizes is the importance of the circadian health as a baseline, um, because what that's going to do and it's people just it's one of those things that it seems like it's too simple to work. Mm. And and I resisted it for the longest time. I knew about Dr. Cruz. I knew about his work. I knew about circadian biology, but I just kind of thought it's too simple to work. I need to do a really hardcore diet um, in order to see a change in my body. And I did see a lot of good changes when doing carnivore. I definitely did. Um, but at a certain point, the good changes stopped and the bad changes started. And I was so into the diet mentality that I didn't draw a, the, the correlation between doing a diet too long and not giving myself a break out of it. You know, I, I just didn't draw that correlation. Um, so I think the, the key thing with leptin is understanding that it's a circadian hormone. And if your circadian rhythms are a mess, then it's going to be very difficult for you to lose weight. It's going to be very difficult for you to reverse your, your leptin um, resistance. Um, it's going to be really difficult for you to fix the cortisol and melatonin patterns. And keeping that as forefront in your day and figuring out ways to continue to implement circadian health, I think is key for staying leptin sensitive because mm -hmm. de during pregnancy, um, that was, I didn't follow my diet perfectly. I did not. Um, but what I did do was follow my circadian principles perfectly. I, I got sun exposure. I saw morning light. I stepped outside for sunset. You know, I blocked artificial light at night. I was very strict with those things. And, you know, I did not gain massive amounts of weight during pregnancy. I have not really experienced a postpartum depression like I did with my daughter. It's been a much, much better experience. And I find that when people really dial in the stuff from the program, if they don't eat perfectly, it doesn't ruin everything, you know? Um, and that if people are really, really hungry before bed, I just tell them to have some fat, you know, like have a pat of butter with some nice mineral salt or uh, Celtic sea salt, um, have that just don't, uh, to have your insulin go up because insulin and leptin are going to compete with one another for that docking space um, at the hypothalamus while you're sleeping. So if your insulin is up, then your leptin's not going to be able to dock at the hypothalamus. So, you know, with the maintaining the results long term, I think it starts with continuing to maintain the circadian rhythms, 
blocking the artificial light at night, getting as much sunlight exposure as you possibly can. Those things are all free. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and even if you work in an office, poking your head out the door for two minutes, 30 seconds, just doing it as often as you can is going to help. Um, it's going to give your body that correct signal. So I think people fall into this trap of like, I have to do everything perfectly. I have to do the diet perfectly. I have to do the light stuff perfectly when it's quantum. So it's the very small little thing that you're doing that's going to yield really large results. Um, so I hope that's encouraging to people. And then, yeah, with this, with the food before bed, like just literally do your best, try to keep the food as far away from sleep as you can. And just keep in mind that if you're eating cookies before bed, insulin is going to be up and leptin is not going to dock to the hypothalamus. And there's a signal of like how much stored energy on your body is not going to reach your brain that night. Um, so your appetite's probably an energy output for tomorrow is probably going to be a little jacked up. The good news is get your sun exposure. If you have the cookies, okay, get your sun exposure next day, um, set your rhythms correct. Don't eat that cookies before bed. And then that night, the leptin will be able to, to properly communicate to the hypothalamus. And the next day, you'll probably feel better and not have an appetite that's out of whack, you know? Oh, definitely. And then also the cold exposure. That's another oh, way yeah. to help with the leptin sensitivity. Oh, yes. Because I was saying that I'm in a different place um, to people who may be thinking of resetting that in the morning, mm -hmm. I get up while it's still dark, catch a train uh, and then walk back home. So I walk through the sun's rise and it's wow. really, really cold. Like it's minus three. That's Celsius. I'm not I think that's probably something like 10 or something Fahrenheit. So, so I get my and, and I'm not jogging. I'm walking. So it's not too stressful, but it's really, really cold. So I'm getting my cold. Um, I'm getting my grounding because I've got grounding shoes and socks and then I touch plants and things on my way. Um, and uh, that really works for me at the moment in the winter. But then I was just thinking from your perspective, would you say that that would be too much for somebody that's very leptin um, resistant or could anybody um, embrace the cold like I am? Because it's basically people getting up, having pre-workout monster drinks or, mm -hmm. um, or, or coffee and then doing crossfit that's mm -hmm. the and they're not eating for um three hours whereas whereas i um have my breakfast as soon as i get home so i mm -hmm. probably saw the sunset half an hour before the breakfast so yeah. what's your thoughts on that kind of protocol would you say that's more of an intermediate or um beginner or advanced it's just i always do something with somebody and then i obviously run with it or add my own take on it because everything always evolves and we all you know work oh, with yeah. different clients with different challenges in different climates yeah i think the more that you become left insensitive the more you can kind of play around with that you know um you are i would say more at, at intermediate and advanced when it comes to leptin sensitivity um, and being connected, you know, you're very dialed in with your circadian health. You're very dialed in with, with all things quantum biology and cold exposure and all that. If someone comes to me extremely leptin resistant, I'm going to tell them before maybe they go on the train, if they want to do that walk, that they need to eat protein and fat mm -hmm. first, eat a little something first, because it's food is a zeitgeist or it's a secondary circadian signal. And we have to um, really get that circadian rhythm as strong as we possibly can to reset those leptin levels. So I oftentimes get people coming into my programs and they'll message me after a couple of weeks and say, it's not working. And I'm like, let's talk, let's take apart your morning. Mm -hmm. And they're like, uh, I'm getting up at five and I'm doing a workout. Um, and then I eat and then I see the sun and I'm like, can you please take a few weeks off of that morning workout and rest do, or just do red light therapy, journal, meditate, rest, eat breakfast when you wake up and not do this workout in the morning. And that's a really hard sell for people because mm -hmm. they are under that impression that if they don't work out, they're going to gain weight. If they don't work out, they're not going to lose the weight. And so they have to keep the workout in, but what they don't understand is that's inappropriate um, for those cortisol levels at that time of day when they're as dysfunctional as they are. So, you know, as you become more leptin sensitive, you can 
delay breakfast a little bit more. Um, I still don't love people to not eat until noon. I don't, I really don't like that for anyone. Um, but if anyone can get away with that, it would be someone who is outside, you know, living on the beach connected to the earth, because like you mentioned earlier, we're only really supposed to get one third of our energy from food and food is electrons. Right. And so Mm -hmm. If, because people, I get this art and I know I'm going off on a crazy tangent here, but this is an argument I get constantly when I talk about, please don't intermittent fast till noon every single day. Please don't do coffee for breakfast. People every time, well, the cavemen did it. Our ancestors did it. Do you think our ancestors ate breakfast? And I'm like, I don't think that they, first of all, I don't know. No, we've lost 90% of our (laughs) time. I don't know. Uh, and there was a paper out last year that said that fasting in the afternoon is better than the morning fast anyway. But right. also with our ancestors, we've got no idea what they actually did. Right, exactly. Yeah. So there's that argument. But then second of all, theoretically, let's say they did do the fasting. They were getting those other two thirds of the electrons that we are not getting as modern humans. They're getting sunlight. They have circadian rhythms. They sleep outside on the ground connected to the earth. We're supposed to get electrons from the earth, right? From being connected to the earth. But most of us live indoors. We don't see the sun. So if you're living an indoor life, you're not connected to the earth. You're not gathering electrons from the earth. You're not getting electrons from sunlight exposure, those other forms, those other ways that we're supposed to get that energy, then this like, I'm going to fast every day till one or two in the afternoon is going to be really, really stressful on your body because that is biologically not, you're, you're already living out of balance with the way that we are supposed to be living. You're already living in this environment with all this fake lighting, phone screens, computers and and I I love my technology I love my conveniences but you know what it is um it's about 40 degrees which for some people that's like warm um but it's winter here it's 40 degrees I'm outside with no coat on and I'm getting sun exposure I'm on the computer yes um, but I've hardwired my computer into the um, internet and this is you know this is my way of trying to mitigate um modern life and also it it helps my appetite correct itself, believe it or not. And again, it seems too simple to be true, but that, <laughs> yeah, so sorry, I just went on this like oh, super no, it's long fine. tangent. The thing is, that's what I found. It's like the 80-20 and there's like the 80-20 of hypnosis and the 80-20 of Pilates and yoga. There's always a certain pose or exercise I do. And yeah. I know what you mean. And, and this is another thing that you touched on that reminded me of something that really annoys me is that, um, cortisol is hugely involved in leaky gut and if you've yes. got a leaky gut, you mustn't take probiotics and then being a biochemist originally I've worked with all kinds of bacteria and they really don't like going in the freezer let alone going in a tablet and that really annoys me because this is a whole other angle of um, circadian biology because mm-hmm. it get a different gut microbiome whether it's spring summer or winter regardless of what we eat and it changes depending on what we eat anyway and it's back to people just think cortisol um it does get a bad rap but we have to Mm -hmm. remember we die without it but unfortunately if we continue with this business of fasting in the morning uh, and putting the cortisol up putting coffee into your gut when it's empty of food and yes that can annoy some people well we're now opening up for leaky gut when once you've started to do that you you know you can get immune problems brain fog um weight gain uh, angry um gut microbiome because obviously they can make neurotransmitters and things like that as well so they do control our mood so that's like a totally different perspective of why yes i think fasting's fine but if you're feeling rubbish then stop doing it just because um there's benefits to autophagy and fasting I don't deny Mm -hmm. it one bit Mm -hmm. and even like I said right earlier in this oh I've done a seven day fast and I'd like to do a 40 day fast it doesn't mean that it's something that people are supposed to do all the time right and um yeah I, I agree and actually another important point that you've raised I'm obviously sitting inside 
uh, and people might be thinking, well, what's she doing talking about quantum biology in front of technology? Well, there I've got a UVA lamp on and I'm really in love with my indoor UVAs. I just discovered it by accident. And then Carrie and I and then we trailed through Jack Cruz's stuff about UVA lights. That's really beneficial. I've got a lamp in front of me that's um, like a, a lighting, but it's got one of these Edison bulbs. I've got a little red light that clips onto my computer here like this, which, oh, nice. which I use to sort of produce a sort of more natural wavelength. I'm wearing an EMF blocking T-shirt. This is a UK company because I use Layla Q sometimes, but this UK one makes cotton. But I've got my nice. red blockers on. And then this is Sarah's blankie. It's like an EMF blanket. It's like blocking. And yeah. it's one of these things that I'm not like the leader of the foil hat brigade <laughs> I, I just personally find that um what why not do that because if I'm on a plane yeah. with this people think oh she's in a blanket or if I go <laughs> under my blanket on the plane people think oh she's just got flight phobia but then I had to do 10 flights in sort of five five weeks and this is partly why I've got this sore throat thing because I never mm. normally get ill and I completely blame the airports and the EMFs uh, without with hands down and it's really made me take it really seriously now because my mum and dad um, don't they have a mobile but it's never turned on and they live somewhere really rural in Wales and that nobody cares about so there's no satellites or anything so, so they've got a much better EMF um, tolerance than I have even though I know much more about it than them and they don't laugh at Blanky or this or the glasses that they just don't take any notice so, so I think for people who are on the fence about EMF I mm -hmm. would block against it anyway, because people like my mum and dad are the example of the indestructible seniors because they drink alcohol at lunchtime and the evening. They <laughs> eat seed oils. They eat sugar. They um, sometimes don't see the sun rise or set. My mum thinks the sun's going to kill her. Yet they uh, go in plate. They have loads of holidays a year, so they get blasted by airports, yet they're always fine. So maybe you might want to like add in on what you think about the chronic EMF exposure and what you think about EMF blocking items because Carrie and I agree with her 100% here there are studies that if you completely block all EMFs natural ones as well you can give yourself a nervous breakdown mentally mm -hmm. but with me and my mental health if I do something to disturb it I'll know within an hour and I've never had a problem of, of like with EMF canapes or blanket because I sleep with it over my head or clothing whereas yeah. um Again, I know you've got the Layla Q harmonizer. I don't mm -hmm. completely, I don't understand enough about how they work to buy into them. But whereas my little tiny brain can accept, okay, this is a thing that stops as much of the um, radiation hitting me. It probably doesn't block all of it, but uh, it's like a shield. Yeah, I mean, the biggest problem with non-native EMF is really what it does to our the cells in our body, the mm. the dehydration factor. Just to keep it super simple, um, you know, Doctor the the research is done out of Doctor Gerald Pollack's lab, and also Doctor Martin Paul is a, a the biggest researcher on the topic. And I recommend anybody listening follow um, those gentlemen's work, those doctors' work, uh, to understand more about the topic. But essentially. Um, our bodies are 99% water molecule. You know, there's water molecules surrounding pretty much every cell in our body. And uh, when we're exposing our bodies to these frequencies, it can take that water level down 15 to 20%. Again, according to the research in Dr. Pollock's lab, it can also flood the cell with calcium, um, creating a horrible energy issue within the cell. And so um, I do think that doing what you can to mitigate non-native EMF is going to be a huge health upgrade. I see people struggling with everything from um, headache to brain fog to arthritis to stiffness, joint pain, um, dry skin, dry eyes. I mean, just so many health problems. You know, I actually had um, somebody on my show who's a hydration expert, and she was basically saying that they can trace pretty much every disease known to man back to a hydration issue. Mm -hmm. And so I think knowing that information, doing what you can to protect yourself, we live in a modern world, we live in EMF soup, so we're not going to be able to just get rid of everything. Um, 
but I think doing what you can to protect yourself is, is really important. Um, the harmonizers, the blocks, those don't block non-native EMF, but they mm. have been shown to neutralize the effects. Um, studies using HRV, mm. all types of studies using sleep studies and these products. So they aren't going to get rid of the frequencies, but they can neutralize the harmful effects. Um, and again, they've got a lot of science to back that up. Uh, but if someone doesn't want to buy those products, I just say your distance is your friend mm -hmm. and duration. So try to decrease your uh, proximity to these things. Turn off your Wi-Fi at night. And if you're going to be on your phone and not have it plugged into an Ethernet cable, that's what I try to do. Then uh, duration, just try to try to do it less or go outside barefoot you know, mm. under the sun. And that's what I do if I'm like, yeah, I, I do all my phone stuff um, or, or do what my mum and dad do and have it off 90% of the time. Yeah. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, definitely. But also the whole water thing, a lot of um, people forget that our exclusion zone water acts as a buffer against heavy metals. And it's, and also it's um, part of our, uh, another layer of our molecular battery as energy. That's why I think ATP isn't just the energy currency of the cell. Mm -hmm. We've got to bear in mind the electric body and we could do, people could go all day talking about that. There's actually a summit coming up. But then another aspect of EMFs that I think is really interesting is that from a physics point of view, aren't we something like 90% empty space? But mm -hmm. then in between all of our cells and that empty space, there's always these communications between cells especially the immune system it's very the immune systems are very sort of chatty um talkative uh, system that's really complicated and that's why i brought up the subject of um having being unwell and emfs because i think that the emfs that i um are exposed to and i have got a really good immune system it just has disturbed its ability to communicate and chat so, so there's that aspect of a quantum approach as well that i think it interferes with the subtle communications between the immune system which we don't really understand properly either um catherine uh, yes is it yes dr clinton is uh, yes. into all of that she's lovely but i think again not to scare people, um, because the other really important thing about humans is hormesis. And my mum and dad are a really good example that they, they they live somewhere and haven't been exposed to that much EMFs, but then they love going into really heavy EMF environments for long periods. Mm -hmm. They get blasted and then they go back and rest from it a bit. So e even if people can't get away from it, like I can't get away from it, I live in a city, I still always make sure I find special less emf time for myself so i can sort of recuperate yeah, yeah. because we are going to build up a resistance towards emfs human beings are hugely adaptive and that's why people of my age i'm in the sort of category where it annoys me but it doesn't massively mm -hmm. affect me unless i have to do 10 flights in five weeks whereas <sighs> For your your children, they're more susceptible to it mm -hmm. because they've come into this world straight into 5G, whereas my mum and dad have gone through the whole no G and they've gradually had a chance to be exposed to it and get used to it. So it's again like everything. I, I never want to scare people about it. And I just always think we don't know the full research. It's not right. difficult to protect yourself. You don't have to buy EMF protecting clothing. It's not right. that expensive and it doesn't do any harm. And like you said, distance is really important and just mm -hmm. being aware. So sometimes just thinking, actually, do I need to go and play on TikTok for an hour? <laughs> Could I go and play no. with my children instead uh, yeah. for an hour? Uh, and it's just like like you were saying it's this something that's there and and it's like back to all these people who do everything right and still have problems sometimes they've not considered their emfs because they think it's like um tin foil hattery and, and it might be for them that's the biggest needle mover just because they've never looked at it before yeah i agree i think that's that's a big thing. And, you know, kids, their brains are developing um, and they're a lot more sensitive to those frequencies as well. So we really have to do what we can to, to protect our kids, you know? Yeah. Um, we've talked about so many different things. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would love to kind of get your perspective on supplements um, okay. and, and just dive into that a little bit, because I think that I, I fall, I felt, you talked about probiotics. Um, I've fallen into that trap before myself of just like, I need to do, um, 
all these different supplements to help me to feel better, to lose weight. What, what's your thought on that is with, with your background? Um, I think with probiotics, okay. If somebody's taken lots of antibiotics um, and really trashed their flora, um, it's okay because you're rebuilding. And then if you really, really love your probiotics, ro- use a different brand every month, rotate mm. it. Otherwise you'll end up with a dominant colony. If you don't like tablets, then you can make fermented food like kefir and kimchi and all of that. Um, the whole histamine thing is, That's really interesting because women are more sensitive to histamines when they're bleeding on their period and a bit after. So Mm -hmm. if you are a bit sensitive, don't eat it then. There's there's a lack of sunlight and red light element to histamines. And also some people need a bit more vitamin C because the the Dow enzyme that processes histamines needs vitamin C. So, So sometimes people who think they're histamine intolerant can get away with a little bit of fermented food at the right time. Uh, then that was the pro that's what I think about um the the, the bacteria but on the other hand um I don't use them a- anymore but every I do make kefir sometimes and um I uh, went through I know this is going to sound really weird I went through a phase of drinking rainwater it only started because mm. one day I wanted to make a cup of coffee and I didn't have any water and I didn't want to use the tap water but I had loads of rainwater and um then Carrie and I had a discussion about it and we concluded that's actually not a stupid thing to do after all and I'm sure it's not it's not dirty but it's not clean um either so I get some natural microbes from my um from my rainwater then when it, back to vegetables and things there are lots of interesting um fungi and microbiota in the soil so um I, uh, if I am going to eat a root vegetable, I don't bother to completely skin it or wash all the earth off because our ancestors would have a little bit of earth never hurt anybody. Um, so that's another way for people that want to do it naturally. Uh, that's the that's the, the the probiotics angle covered. When it comes to quantum supplements, I know you made a podcast on methylene blue. And yes, mm-hmm. I think that's really useful if somebody's bathed in EMFs or has yep. a mitochondrial problem. Um, and, th- th- you know, there's lots and lots of papers on that. Then along that lines, there's also Sheila G or C60, which are basically mm. um, Sheila G is more complicated because it's sort of this tarry substance that comes out of a mountain. And we've used it for thousands of years and there's plenty of research and it contains C60 and C60. Uh, I, don't, I know you did a podcast on this as well. Mm-hmm provides electrons and I would say that's safe enough and Sheila G is something that people use for altitude sickness and monks would have eaten it when they had to go out on the mountains and meditate for a week in the cold Uh, and um, again I think those things are are something to to try if you're very interested in mitochondria and and electrons then you've done numerous um podcasts and things on minerals and there are different brands but i'm with you 100 on that that minerals are really important Mm -hmm. and um you know we each person has their own brand they use and then you can obviously buy mineral water or add it back into your reverse osmosis um I'm very much a light person, as in uh, I uh, would rather have a spirity lamp than a vitamin D supplement. And again, you've Mm -hmm. made a podcast about this. This is back to what we were talking about, that there's lots of stages that vitamin D gets made in and our bodies know the difference between a tablet and what I made. Um, Then obviously, of course, you can do tests, say if you were deficient in one or two particular things, that would be replacing a deficiency. And that's really important in health. Uh, And then there are a million other supplements that we could talk about, ranging from CBD to medicinal mushrooms to things for healing injuries like peptides, anti-aging supplements. And those to me all come into a I've got a goal and I want this supplement to do this. Then you've got obviously detox supplements as well, which... um, that's my thoughts on them that um if you if you have a particular goal in mind of like you want to play with nootropics or do bodybuilding or repair a tendon there's very specific groups of supplements for that for other people that just want to be healthy um i just think i would such i would to get i got rid of all supplements and just did um quantum uh, and that's why i don't take Mm -hmm. very much anymore because i realized i don't need most of it so there's the elimination process. And I found I needed magnesium. That's one thing that I do need. And then obviously, if I do have a particular goal 
or whatever, I'll choose a supplement because I want it to do something. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So, uh, and also, I spoke. I suppose another sub subject is we didn't touch on was medication because. Oh yes, I just I saw wanted, that on the yeah. Yeah, that was something that's really important because I think um because I know we might have to wrap up soon that anybody yes. that's ever taken a lanzapine or zyprexa it's absolutely terrible for leptin surges and leptin sensitivity uh, problems and and they use it on teenagers and people might have taken it twenty years ago if you've ever taken it definitely and you've got sort of issues with your weight definitely check that and also I think SSRIs over time uh, are going to cause leptin issues because they make people insulin resistant and if and we know that leptin becomes before insulin so, so again um, some people view psychiatric medication almost as a supplement I mean the US is much worse than the UK uh, and it's all back to again I know you had your experiences with psychiatric meds and I did as well yes. and I'm extremely converted now to quantum biology and the right kind of diet for even things up to bipolar so schizophrenia and autism they're something separate and that's a different intervention but everything else um I would say up to there I would really look into quantum for because um it's a really untapped area and I think you found the same with psychiatric meds that was it you were able to to sort of get rid of those Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, th you know, basically through diet and through uh, circadian biology, I've been able to stay off of the psychiatric meds that I was on for, you know, 20 plus years. And I think a lot of people are kind of trapped on those medications and, and not really seeing a lot of hope. But I think when we really support our mitochondria with giving it the right signal, I think it comes down to your body, what, what, what you've been talking about in this chat. And I love the science that you're really putting behind it, giving your body the signal of, Hey, it is uh, January 27th. It is 1 15 mm. PM. And just continuing to let your body know what time of day, what time of year it is as often as you can through sunlight, temperature, food, darkness, light, all of these things are super, super important. And the literature on mental health and, uh, you know, circadian disruption is, is tremendous. And so mm. I, I think that that has to be looked at as well, for sure. I know. I think also because I didn't, I didn't, I got so excited at the supplements question. I think a lot of it, it's like the psychiatric meds, um, society and other things, and business and internet make us think it's the FOMO that if we're not taking mm -hmm. them, we're missing out on something. Uh, and that, and that's why I think people take them not, not, you know, obviously people are desperate to get better and it's terrible having anxiety or depression yet. We, we feel, okay, well, if other people are all on these SSRIs, maybe I'm missing out or, you know, I, I should be on five supplements and, and there's this FOMO mm -hmm. and obviously you being in, I, I do, I do know about sales and funnels and stuff that yeah. a of the time you're playing on people's emotions so I think there's a massive amount of advertising um and because EMFs and avoiding and going out in the sun is free and so is yep. grounding obviously that's why um it's not favorable because it's and anything that's trying to make money will will find its best ways to poo poo it and when we are mm -hmm. competing with things like Apple and Kellogg's and um monsanto and all a lot of things have got a lot of money that can out message us basically so people have to really think hard um do i really need this or do i think i need this uh, or is somebody else trying to tell me that i think i need this when it exactly. comes to supplements but then like i said before it does come down to a specific goal that's a whole world of supplements and psychiatry yes I 100% think people do sometimes need to have meds but I don't think mm -hmm. they need to be on four or to, yep. or to have them all the time especially benzodiazepines they're meant to oh, be yeah. short the term um yeah. and I'm not for one moment dis dissing in any way people's diagnoses or medications and no. you know I believe in everything and I believe if somebody's suffering you should try and alleviate it I just think mm -hmm. how people are doing it isn't that the answer to life's problems isn't in a tablet I'm afraid but it, it, it can help you know um it can help and like anything I always think well we'll just try it you know I'm very much for okay I'm here to support people if you want to try this that and the other 
ask me and I'll advise you. I'm not going to sell it to you or to tell you how to do it in detail, but I'm going to, I'll help you if you're interested because yeah. you've got to satisfy human curiosity. And sometimes people have got to waste money or have a horrible experience with a supplement or a psychedelic or a medication to think, okay, hang on, right. I'm leaving the biochemistry alone. Now I'm going to explore the water, the EMFs, the grounding, and they've got to come to that decision by themselves, not to be told. Yep. Absolutely. I completely, completely agree um, that, you know, I, I completely agree with you about needing to alleviate people and help them out where they are. Mm. Um, but yeah, when someone starts to get on five or six different medications, it just becomes this endless loop. Uh, and I feel like there's a better way. There's definitely a better way. So I think quantum biology, circadian biology can offer a lot of insights and I know you have a lot of tips and tricks and, and things. Um, how can people, if they want to find you and your work, what's the best way for them to, to find you? Oh, it's just busy superhuman um, on Instagram, TikTok and um, YouTube. And, and I've, I need to update my website and I've got a form on it and people can just contact me um, th um, through that. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I know other people in the community, so people will probably come across me again in other people's podcasts. And I'm kind of I haven't made any content for a bit because of my voice, but mm. um, I have got a YouTube channel, which I'm going back to and going to make some longer form content. But just if you just remember Busy Superhuman and um, DM or comment or, or whatever, and I'll um, do my best to answer the questions obviously I can't give medical advice and uh, you know and dosages and stuff like that and obviously not to take the piss uh, and expect a whole consultation but I am like you pretty generous with comments and also I'll point people towards books and courses because you and Carrie and Catherine Clinton have got lots of very 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 affordable courses some of them are like 40 dollars or 47 yeah. Uh, and and like you said, um, sometimes even if you know we know it all, we still need to sit down with a course for half a day and or a, a three hours and have it all in one place. So, so yeah. that's how I kind of approach things with people. Obviously, I do consultations as well, um, but I'm working towards like a bigger project. And and sometimes I'm happy to just answer because sometimes it's what you might find it's one question, mm -hmm. and that's all people know. Um, but I, I will a lot of the time keep referring back to, you know, do you, are you seeing the sunrise, are you seeing the sunset, because I want people to have done the basics already. So I'm not reiterating. You know, and I fully appreciate there are lots of people out there that are doing everything right. And it might be one thing that they're missing. So, you know, it's I, and I think I'm a bit the same as you as in some ways that, I, that I'm always going to ask about the light environment before mm -hmm. over and above anything else. And then if they're doing that right, then I'll dive in a bit more. Yes. I love that. Well, I'll make sure I put all of your links into the show notes so people can find you. And this has been an amazing conversation. We probably could have talked for like three more hours. So I'll definitely have to bring you back on um, mm -hmm. to dive into some other topics. I'm sure we're going to get some good uh, feedback in the chat. So thank you everyone for watching and thank you, Sarah, for being here. Oh, yes. No, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to meet you and chat with you properly, because obviously when you meet someone online, you don't imagine actually being with them. And right. one, point, one point I've got to make is um, Dr. Pollock is going to come on my YouTube channel to oh. talk about water because I did protein folding as my PhD and he got so excited about that. So, so uh, you know, if people have particular water questions, just put them in the comments and I'll pose them to him as well, because I think what I'm going to ask him about is about water and memory so I can, you know, I've got my questions and, you know, um, people who are interested in the memory of water, traumas, traumatized water coming out of the tap, uh, sound therapy and water. So any water questions, put them to Sarah or to me and I'll put them to Dr. Pollock. Perfect. Well, I appreciate that. And yeah, you guys make sure you make those comments and, and thanks again for coming on.